uh, something that BPW is working since many years ago, which is Women on Boards. Our main speaker is uh, Larissa Miller. She is a uh, founding president uh, of uh, the uh, BPW uh, Miami club that is uh, right now in the process of the start. She is a CEO of Phoenix Global, a business and development consulting firm, executive vice president, STP Capital Partners, North Macedonia, executive director, chamber, global chamber of business leaders, ambassador of the state of the Africa diaspora, previously personal advisor and head of business development for a member of the royal family in Abu Dhabi, named one of the top 100 people in finances, top 10 most influential friends of Africa, 100 global women of excellence, and sustainable development goals partner. He belongs to many international boards in addition to Global Chamber of Business Leaders, Geneva Global Initiative, People to People International Board of Directors for Union of Business Ladies, Global Impact Africa, and others. I am very pleased to introduce to all of you Larissa Miller. Larissa, before you. Thank you, Yasmin. It's my pleasure to be here with all of my BPW sisters around the world as we are all self-isolating and quarantining in wherever we are in this world. Um, it's such a difficult and challenging time. It's nice to know that we can come together and have this, this time of sisterhood and a little bit of normalcy in our lives, which, which have really uh, become a rather unexpected and unprecedented time. But together we will get through this and um, we will come out stronger and I will look forward to seeing many of you at the different BPW um, meetings and conferences um, in the fall. Um, as Yasmin was kind enough to mention, I am the new president of the BPW Miami Club, which is going through the approval and, and charter process at the moment. We had hoped to launch by now, but um, in light of our circumstances, that's been difficult, but we may be come the club of the new millennium, new millennium, the new decade, um, and have a virtual launch. So I would love to, to invite you all to be a part of that as well, and I will keep you informed. But today we're here to talk about um, a very, very important topic, not only to women, but to global business, and that's women on boards. Um, you know, we're now seeing that business, in order to be in maximum, have maximum profitability, businesses have to be very inclusive of women and include women as they are, not women as they think they should be. And I'll explain more as we go through the slides. So the, in the United States, women now hold, and I'm gonna say this is a big success, but yet I'm still not happy with it. In the United States, women now hold more than 20% of the board seats at the top 3,000 publicly traded companies. Um, an organization, um, I have to put my glasses on because I can't read anymore. Um, this was mandated by an advocacy group, 2020 Women on Boards. And um, we actually reached the 20% threshold in 2019, which was a year early, and everyone celebrated the fact that, wow, women are now 20% of the global board seats, which was absolutely confounding to me, because when you consider that women offer up 45 to 50% of the workforce, why we're still at 20% and actually celebrating that um, is, is baffling to me. Now it is a great accomplishment from where we were. We were only, I believe at 14% um, just 10 short years ago. So 20% is a great accomplishment. But in 2020, in the century of women, undoubtedly 20% should be 30% or even 40% or higher. So fundamentally, we have to understand what boards are in order to be able to see how we best fit with, with boards. Um, there are two different main types of boards. One is a corporate board and one is a nonprofit board. And the corporate directors and corporate board members are primarily there for growth strategies and profit generalization. 
uh, they are the, the advocates and the, um, um, the stewards for the shareholders and, st and stockholders of, of a corporate entity. And uh, these are paid positions. These are the positions that are predominantly dominated by men and have been since the start of business. And this is where we really need to be able to see the most improvement for as far as women on boards. Nonprofit boards where women tend to dominate are the boards that are um, not charged with, with profit generation for shareholders, but rather on fundraising, um, um, and, and decision making relative to the um, social impact of a particular organization, NGO, or entity. Even corporates who have um, CSR strategies will often have a board of advisors that they stand up for, uh, and largely women are targeted towards those boards. Um, Nonprofit boards are non paid generally. Um, and, uh, and of course, the corporate boards are, are paid. Now, where we need to be moving forward is seeing women with a greater presence on corporate boards. There are mandates all around the world at the moment to have a target of 30% by 2023 or 40% or by 2030. And almost every single one of these, these targets and mandates are falling short as we're coming up on, on these time goals. And, um, and corporates are actually struggling with how do we go about doing that? Uh, so there is definite interest. It's just, we still have to be able to sell ourselves to the corporate board structure, to the men on the board and to the corporations themselves. And I'm hopeful that as we start to make our voices known and, and um, express the value that women have on boards, that we will have to do a lot less selling and we will be invited uh, a lot more frequently. Uh, while we still have a way to go, we are gaining momentum. Uh, in this, the UN declared decade of action and the century of women. Um, out of uh, 1,183 companies that installed a new CEO last year, 264 of them, 22%, chose a woman to be the head of the company, compared with just 15% in 2014, which is actually a, a very significant jump in, a jump in the business world when you consider that over the years, the percentages of CEO and board members for women generally rose at around 5 to 7%. So in just five short years, we've seen a, a very large jump in the number of, of women CEOs. And when they measure um, the annual report of women CEOs done by Challenger Gray and Christmas, when they, when they measure women CEOs, it's for organizations that have an employee base greater than 10. Um, an analysis of more than 8,600 countries, uh, companies in 49 countries show that women held 16.9% of global board seats in 2018, which was up from 15%. So in just two years, we went up almost 2%, which, you know, again, for, for a global positioning is a very remarkable jump. Um, but this needs to be much higher. And globally, we need to be able to say that women are on boards at around 30%. And there's no excuse for the fact that we aren't at this point. And it certainly isn't for lack of, of trying or for lack of qualifications. It's all about opening the dialogue um, with men and, um, and making them realize the value that women add to a board and not add to the board as women who act the way the men act, but women as women are. Um, in 2019, 175 women replaced male CEOs and 89 replaced outgoing female CEOs. However, men replaced female CEOs at 114 companies. So we've absolutely negated ourselves a bit there. And men replaced other men at the remaining 805 companies. So there again, we still struggle. It's a one step forward, two steps backwards proposition. Um, women in government and nonprofit sectors, however, made up the largest number of incoming CEOs. And in 2019, 52% of open CEO slots for nonprofits and NGOs were filled by women, uh, which equates to the way nonprofit boards and boards have representation of women as well. 
Only 5.3% of board chair positions were held by women in 2018. That to me is a very significant number, not in a good way, but in a way that we need to begin starting to see that number change as well. Because it's all well and good to have women sitting on a board, but if you can't charge women with the leadership of that board, it makes you think, is the positioning of the woman on that board a token position? Um, is it there just to fill some quota that they have set to be able to say they've achieved so, uh, such a percentage of women on a board? So it's not just women on board, it's allowing women to have a voice and a leadership role on those boards as well. So in the S&P 500 and corporate 500 companies, they're gradually diversifying. And the US is definitely taking the lead on, on where women stand on boards with many of the European companies following suit. But there again, it's board positions, not leadership board positions. More than one quarter, 26% of the S&P 500 board directors are women, which is a record high. So the S&P 500 is, is leading the way, but nevertheless, it's still sitting at 26%. And, you know, we definitely need to applaud the fact that we're at 26%, but I still come back to the fact that in this century of women and the percentage of executive women to executive men, which is sitting, I believe, at 48.3%, we should definitely have a presence that is much greater than 26%. Uh, there are no all-male boards in the S&P 500, and for that, I, th I think that's a very important point to note and something to be applauded. There are no ma all-male boards in the S&P 500. Uh, all companies have at least one woman director. Despite reaching these milestones, the representation of women of S&P 500 boards continues to be low. And they recognize that 26% is still a relatively low number when you consider um, the, the impact and the contribution that women have towards um, the financial sector businesses, especially on, on Wall Street. Despite reaching these milestones, the representation of women um, continues to be low, but there are no all-male boards, and like I said, they all have at least one director. On average, boards today have 2.8 women directors compared to 1.7 a decade ago. And this is a very interesting number because as they've done studies looking at the effectiveness of corporate boards, they find that one woman has a minimal um, effectiveness and two women can actually negate the effectiveness that just one woman has because when you have two women on a board, they are put there and found to be, and how do, um, how do I want to say this? I know how I want to say it. I just don't want it to sound in a negative fashion, but you know, when there are two women on a board, they tend to compete with one another. And it negates the impact that women contribute to that board. They find that three women on a board is the ideal number for impact because those three women will unite together. Those three women, we have the same tendencies, we have the same genetic makeup, so, so we have um, a tendency to be more emotional, we have a more out of the box way of thinking and less linear. And when there's three women, you come together to back each other up much more than if it was two women. Um, boards that have two women have found that it's been much less effective than if they had no women at all, which isn't a good thing for us um, as proponents of, of women on boards. Um, but that goes back to the fact that, you know, women still are struggling to climb the corporate ladder. And um, we, often have a tendency to sabotage one another rather than support one another because there are so few opportunities for women still um, to be able to climb into those senior roles. And I think right there we need to start building an environment that, which includes men in this dialogue because it's so important, uh, building an environment where women don't have to feel as though it's it's us against each other where we are competing for that one position and um, where it's a competition. Um, we, we need to begin supporting one another and lifting one another up and if another female is more qualified, um, you know, pushing forth that woman so that she can do her best because as a woman excels in a company, it's found that all the other women in the company have much better opportunities for growth and, and acceleration within their, um, within their career climb. 
So it's important that we stop competing with one another and start supporting one another. And I think we will see these board numbers and CEO numbers and senior level executive numbers uh, start to climb tremendously. Um, in uh, only 8% of boards include just one woman, which is an improvement from 36% in just 10 years. So most boards have at least two women, um, which is very commendable. Uh, like I said, three is the ideal number. Um, they found that profitability of a company um, jumps dramatically, almost in the 60% when you have uh, three or more women on the board, uh, which is a very significant number in the corporate world. Um, and in 2019, women accounted for almost half of the new board directors in the S&P 500. So with that being said, you know, it's very reasonable to expect that within the next five years in the S&P 500, women will be able to crest the 30s and perhaps, perhaps even reach the 40% mark um, as executive board directors. And undoubtedly, many of those will start to be able to realize leadership positions. However, women of color were only 10% of new board directors. And that tells us that we still have a very long way to go. Um, percentage wise in the S&P 500, there are uh, a much larger percentage of non-minority um, women. But um, when you do um, percent by percent basis, we should be looking at, you know, at least 40% of the new out of the females, 40% of the females on board directors should be um, minority. And it isn't because we have a quota to reach, it's because we're all holding the same level positions and we all have equal qualifications. So as far as I'm concerned, while gender um, balance shouldn't even be a topic anymore, it shouldn't be women CEOs or women executives, it should just be CEOs and executives, uh, we need to remove the gender from boards. We need to remove the gender from, from career positions. And along with that, we need to incorporate diversity and stop seeing, you know, Hispanic and, um, and you know, Latin African American and, and Caucasian. It really needs to be seen as um, a unity of, of gender, a uni unity of diversity. And that's truly the only way that we're going to see um, a surge uh, in the Fortune 500 and the S&P 500 and corporations around the world. Um, the profitability, the innovative strategies, and the business acceleration of companies who do not set targets for uh, gender and who do not set targets for ethnicity, but rather have shown through their hiring practices um, in their employee engagements that they don't recognize those as differences, that they see their employees all as one, um, they have about a 75% greater success rate than companies who set minimal standards and targets to meet as far as hiring women and hiring minorities, which is very significant to note. And I think when boards adopt a strategy where they stop saying, okay, we're going to pledge to have two women on our board by 2026. Um, you know, I think if they look at it as we, we pledge to have the most um, accomplished, uh, the most knowledgeable and the most capable board by 2026, and oh wait, we have outstanding women that would enhance that mandate, I think then we'll start to see a greater acceleration in the opportunities for women and the inclusion of women and, um, and how men embrace women. So the value of women on boards, it goes beyond gender balance, as we all know. Uh, researching critical mass can change the boardroom dynamics substantial, substantially, creating an environment where innovative ideas can spring from gender diversity. So we know that men tend to think, and this is a gross generalization, but it generally ap applies. Uh, studies have shown that men think in a very structured and linear fashion for the most part. Um, they're emotionless when it comes to business. Uh, and women, on the other hand, we are emotional creatures. Um, we have an ability to multitask. 
And because we are often working on many different tasks and managing many aspects of life um, at any given time, that we tend to incorporate that into the way we see business as well. So when a company has a problem or um, um, a systemic failure of some sort that they need to, to, to challenge themselves with, or even during this time right now, where the pause button has been hit on, on many businesses and they're trying to figure out their relevancy during this time of, of difficulty, but also trying to um, formulate their plans for recovery and resiliency, they're missing a phenomenal opportunity by not including A, their employees in the dialogue and B, prioritizing women in this dialogue. And I say this because women have an ability to be able to take a problem and see it from about five different angles and come up with non-conventional solutions. And oftentimes it comes from the fact that we, we do have um, a more empathetic and emotional standpoint and we don't turn that off just simply because we're in the office place. So you can have a problem and you see it in a very straight line fashion. And when you ask a woman to take a look at that problem, she'll think about it for a few days and she'll come back with an idea that is a bit unconventional generally and something that no one else has thought of because they can't think like we do. And they suddenly have a light bulb moment where they realize that, wow, the value of women um, if, if they can come up with a solution for this, imagine what they can do if they're sitting on a board and we're working through all of our challenges and all of our issues and, and all of our growth strategies. So this is an opportunity for women to really um, to stand out and really be able to show the ability that we have to um, dissect a problem and put it back together with a solution in a very unconventional strategy. And, um, and that's something that they're recognizing in studies on critical mass and how the dynamics in the boardroom change. When a woman is sitting at the table and she is comfortable to speak, um, oftentimes it's a solution that, you know, at first men may roll their eyes at, but then they'll start to see the value in, in thinking with a very nonlinear and out of the box fashion. And, and that's one of the beauties of women, and that's one of the values that we bring to the corporate table. And that's starting to be recognized and realized and appreciated. We just have to keep accelerating that. Research from scholars and organizations has found that women need to hold at least three board seats to create a critical mass. And this goes beyond just the dynamics of women. This goes to the fact, again, like I said, that when there are three or more women together, we are likely to come together and agree with one another and support one another because there's safety in numbers and there's comfort in, in that. And, you know, it's still sad to say that we need to have safety in numbers, that it's us against them. But in many times, the boardroom dynamics still takes us back to that, where we are the outsiders in a good old boy's world. So when you have three women together, their power is increased, you know, 50 times because they can back one another up. There's no longer that need to compete because it's not just two people together. Uh, and, and the contribution to the overall board success is measurable enough that they now have termed this critical mass, which is very valuable for us. This leads to much better financial performance for the corporation and uh, a much better standing for the women on the board. And those are often the boards that have three or more women where you do find a woman ultimately receives um, the position of chairman or, or um, assistant chair. So women board tenures are shorter. Ah, big surprise. Hey, we get one board seat, but they're only gonna keep us for a year and then they're gonna nominate a man. Um, they've at least hit their target for the time. And, um, and that's something that we're still struggling with because as we reach a 20% or 25% board seat, you know, we often find that many of those boards, the next time that seat is available or the next time they want to do a board restructure, it's, it's filled with a man. Women are less likely to hold the leadership positions on corporate boards like we discussed. And although women holding leader pos leadership's positions on boards is positively associated with all women directors having board tenures. And that goes back to the critical mass statement where if you have 
two women on a board and a third who is the chairman, you suddenly find that you have three women on a board and four women on a board. And the way to stay on a board is to be able to show positive growth and impact to the stakeholders and the shareholders. And if a board isn't performing, a corporation isn't performing, and that undoubtedly results in removal from a board. But when a board is, is accelerating and a board is showing outstanding profitability, and there's three women on a board and a woman as, the, and as a chairman, now you suddenly start to see, you know, okay, we have a fourth woman and we have a fifth woman. And um, this is what's happening in Silicon Valley at the moment. Um, many of the boards now have almost a 50% ratio for the startups, the micro enterprises, the SMEs. Um, now many of these are advisory boards because they haven't reached the level yet where they can have a paid board of directors, but they're finding that the companies that have um, at least a 40% uh, 40 of women on their boards are the ones that are accelerating and growing exponentially over the ones that are all male. Women generally have a positive impact on board tasks, particularly those of a qualitative nature. Um, men have the quantitative and we have the qualitative. Multiple studies show that they are adept at foster, fostering strategy development, um, improving corporate social responsibility related issues. Now, you know, when you say corporate social responsibility, it immediately makes you think back to the nonprofit boards and then you think, yes, well, that's where women are generally targeted. So it stands to reason that they would be the ones to have the um, largest impact on the cor corporate social responsibility strategies. But this is very important to corporate boards. And this is a value that boards are slowly starting to realize that it has nothing to do with nonprofits and NGOs. It has everything to do with the fact that in this world of mandated sustainability, as we move forward, all corporations and businesses, even entrepreneurs, um, micro enterprises, SMEs, all businesses must have uh, a business conscience. And, um, Social responsibility strategies need to be woven into the fabric of every single business, regardless of how big or small it is. You can just be starting out as an entrepreneur. And I tell entrepreneurs, you know, as you start out right off the bat, take 10% of your money and make that some sort of a community or social responsibility gesture that your business does so that it becomes organic to your functions. And this creates great stakeholder value and it creates great value for your customers and clients. Because essentially, if you as a business um, have a social responsibility and they as your customers are, are patronizing you, that passes on to them. They become good stewards of the, of the community and of the environment and of society just simply by being your customer. So, but, but this has not been um, an integral part of many businesses to this point. And when the sustainable development goals um, were released in 2015, boards suddenly started to realize, okay, we need to do something that's sustainable, CSR, CSR, and nothing really measurable was done except for those few companies like Unilever, um, who did an outstanding job under Paul Pullman's leadership and Coca-Cola with their water, women and wellness strategy and so forth. The big boys could afford to be able to massively publicize their CSR gestures. But many of the small companies were left floundering and wondering, what do we do? What do we do that isn't in line with our straight line business strategy that allows us to be able to channel some of what we're doing towards being more, um, being more socially responsible. And they're finding that when you have women on boards and women help to strategize a social responsibility strategy for corporations, again, that corporation now sees greater profitability, um, the client base increases, you give more value to your stakeholders, and at the end of the day, you come um, across in a much stronger standing um, in all of the measured indexes. So while having a woman on a board and task on a corporate board and tasking the women to be the ones to mandate a corporate social responsibility strategy isn't diminishing their role, 
It isn't taking them and saying, well, we've given you a token corporate board seat, but we're still going to keep you in a nonprofit sort of role on the board. Rather, it's corporations recognizing that now moving forward, every single business is going to have to have um, a strategy of social responsibility and a strategy for sustainability. And giving a woman those roles will enhance the corporate board and not diminish it. And it certainly isn't diminishing the impact of the woman since that's now one of the most important corporate targets that we need to focus on moving forward. Um, so this picture that I have on the screen right now is perhaps the most, Im most significant picture. And it's nothing more than a stock image that I came across for when you Google um, um, royalty free board of directors pictures, this is one of the pictures that comes up. And I look at this and I'm, it's, this picture is so telling to me and it's, you know, um, slightly saddening to me in many ways. But if you look at it, you see the body language of the men. They're facing one another, they're engaged in conversation. And there's the woman standing off at the end with no friends to play with on the playground. And, um, and this is still very reminiscent of the way that corporate boards are to this day, especially when there's only one board, only one female on the board seat. And another aspect of this picture that is, is um, a, a little bit saddening to me, but it's something that we've all had to deal with, every single one of us who's been in the corporate business structure. And that is we have to, and, and to this point, we've had to try and blend in as much as possible with the men. So we're an executive woman in an executive man's world. We wear gray suits, we wear black suits. We don't distinguish ourselves in any other way because they won't take us seriously if we don't look like them. And ladies, the last time I checked, I didn't have any body parts that resembled a male. So that makes me completely different right off the bat. And um, yes, there are days when I'm emotional and there are days when, you know, I am juggling so many different things that I just don't have time to sit at a table and plan the next golf outing. But that is something that we should really be embracing and really be proud of. And um, I think that we've earned the right to not only assume executive leadership positions, and we've earned the right to not only sit on executive boards, but we've earned the right to be able to wear a red dress and lipstick and high heels and walk into that room and look completely different. And, and yes, we have a handbag and, and yes, you know, we may be texting our kids at home and so forth, but we have earned that right to be able to be female and feminine and, and embrace what we have as our female qualities. The fact that we do have many different tasks to juggle at any given time. And the fact that we do have good days and we do have bad days. And, you know, we don't have to go on a golf outing with the men to fit in with them. And it's perfectly acceptable to talk to us because we aren't going to talk to you at a board table about folding laundry or, you know, about what we're making for dinner. You know, we actually have a really intellectual and, and valuable contribution to make. And we do think in a very out of the box manner. And it's interesting when a man is, has worked with women, you know, it's very beneficial if a man has once had a female boss, but you know, as, as men work with women and can see the value in women on the team, they're the ones that will sit and often say, look, we have this problem, let's talk through it. But we are still in a male dominated world where men are still used to being executives with other men. And, um, you know, it, it's a good old boys club. They will think of their friends first when a board seat opens and they can't know that we are interested if we don't tell them. So as you are, you know, looking at a particular company that you may want to sit on that executive board seat, we have a very valuable resource available to us right now, which is completely underutilized, and that is LinkedIn. 
I tell everyone it's our digital business card. We don't necessarily need to be giving out paper business cards anymore. As long as we give out our LinkedIn ID, we're, we're connected. LinkedIn is a resource where you can not just have to send a letter to an HR department expressing that you have an interest or sending a letter to the office of the president and whether it ever makes it to his desk or not. Through LinkedIn, you can correct, connect directly with the leaders and the movers and the shakers and those who already occupy board seats and so forth. And you can make it known. You can begin engaging right through LinkedIn. You can make it known. You know, look, I have had these credentials. You know, this has been the main focus of my career. I could add great value. Please keep me in mind when a board seat opens. Now you've put it out there. You make it a lot more difficult for a man when he's been asked to nominate someone for a board seat to just fully disregard that and, and nominate, you know, his golfing buddy or, you know, his, his, you know, um, um, you know, cardiac surgeon or whomever he knows that, that is a, an executive male that would fit well on that board. It makes it very difficult for him not to at least consider what you're saying, but we don't put ourselves out there enough. Uh, we don't make our intentions known. We all say that women need to occupy corporate board seats. Um, and, uh, and then we sit back and we wait for the invitations that never come. Um, we must now start to put our names out there. And if you're a good and qualified woman um, who fits organically with the structure of the board and you've approached another board member or you have approached the, the chairman or the CEO and said, hey, I'd be interested in your board, you know, that's great for them. That looks phenomenal for them when they nominate a woman to the board who makes a magnificent impact, who contributes greatly to the functions of the board, who makes measurable impact as the board moves forward, accelerating the company's profits, the, you know, the, the company's innovative strategies. You know, so the one that nominates the woman who is outstanding as we all would be, um, also gets great value, but they don't know that we're out there waiting for that board seat or looking for that board seat unless we put it out there. And LinkedIn is a mechanism to be able to reach anyone at any level anywhere in the world. Um, you can engage and you can connect with presidents and vice presidents and managing directors. You know, you can create you connect with celebrities and magazine editors. LinkedIn really puts us all in touch with one another. And if we use that resource to accelerate ourselves as business woman, women, we will find that we have abundant opportunities, not only for corporate boards, but for executive level positions that come open. But we have to put ourselves out there. And um, so I urge you, if there are boards, and I think that every single one of us who's interested in a corporate board, take some time to research 10 companies, you know, find where you have your greatest synergies and look at what their board structure is now. If they don't have many women on a board, that's the angle to, to approach them with, you know, send them statistics on, on the value that women contribute to a board and say, look, I would be very interested in contributing the, this value that women can offer. I would be interested in contributing that to your board. I have, you know, these qualifications, this is my background, and it makes it very difficult for us not to be seen if we put ourselves out there. It takes time, but this is a phenomenal resource. And, um, you know, if you put yourself out there for 20 boards, executive level boards, and you have the qualifications, I mean, you know, we can't um, discount the fact that you do have to have the, the background to be able to substantiate your board seat. But if you have the background and you have the interest, um, then it's important for you to um, begin making that known. Um, so, and, and as women on a board, we can nominate other women. So it's a, it's a very big circle. Um, we empower one another. We can get men to empower us, but we really need to begin taking the lead, uh, put on the red dress, put on the lipstick, and, and go out and, and, um, and, and go for what you want. And I guarantee that in the next five years, 
if we all put a consorted effort towards um, claiming some of these board seats, I'm confident that we will see 40% um, women on executive boards coming up within the next five years or so. But so thank you. That's all I have um, today. I hope it's been helpful to you. And I would certainly love to be able to have some discussion um, if you have any questions or if we want to discuss amongst ourselves, I'd love to be able to do that. Larissa, I'm going to jump in first. Thank you very much for a very detailed presentation. And I want to ask you if you can extend just a bit more, even into our discussion time, and talk to us about the duties of a board member so that that gets a bit demystified for the audience. What do you do as a board member in your personal experience? Sure, sure. As a corporate board member, um, it's the responsibility of the business to provide you with the um, annual report, the financial statements. You know, they present you with the problems they're facing, they present you with the successes they're achieving, and you as the board members need to consider them. You need to look at the strategies. Um, you are the ultimate fiduciaries. You decide where and how um, the, the finances should be placed. And, um, and it's a very considered uh, an important position because essentially the operations and the functionings of the company uh, come back to the board. And a business is only, a corporation is only as successful as the board is strong. Um, so as a board member, you consider the information. Um, you may even be able to find some weak links um, or successes that others aren't even recognizing when you go through the annual report. And um, it's your responsibility as a board member to um, you know, make motions, um, expand on those successes, um, help to find solutions for those failures, and, um, and, and collectively you will either continue the mandates of the company if it's running successfully, or help to strategize the solutions for how to repair any damage that may be done or, or any um, weaknesses that there are in the chain so that you can become a much stronger company. Um, but the operations of the company, essentially the decisions for the operation of the company come back to the board, whereas the actual operations of the company fall on the executive team. I hope that was helpful. <laughs> Are there any questions? Hello. Hello. Hello, I am Carla. I am in Italy. I am in Vicenza and also in Italy. Hello, everybody. A special hello to Yasmin because I see her from a long time. And uh, as, I have um, a, a particular situation here in Italy because here in Italy we have a special law for women on board, but uh, only for listed companies and uh, only for a special percent because uh, only for the 25 percent on the total board. But uh, uh, unfortunately, this law is uh, like uh, a milk because uh, we have a final date and uh, they have to, to propose again uh, this law to be approved uh, in the parliament because now it is not uh, regular. So also if there is this law, but uh, we have a particular uh, statement because only for listed companies and not all for all the board. This is a problem for us also because we had a lot of uh, uh, online meeting or courses uh, or others to be member in the board but after that we have uh, many lists of women but uh, no one call us. BPW Italy has planning a special uh, uh, course at the University in Bologna to be member in uh, this board. I have a diploma, for example. We were 20 uh, BPW members, but uh, at the end, uh, no one uh, received the nomination in the board. So um, it's very strange because we have a, a, a law 
but we haven't the nominations. Well, it's when you say that it, it is very challenging because many times it's like with with all targets that they set, you know, the date goes by and it's not achieved and they just extend the date or there's always a reason that they have for why it wasn't. And, and that really makes you realize that a lot of this is still very token, that they're doing it just to be able to, to say the lip service, hey, we're going to have so many women on a board and then that's as far as it goes. It doesn't go much further than talk. But what I find is that when you take all of those companies and you look at who is qualified in your organization and you send that company a letter saying, hello, we have these five women who are qualified for your board seats. Here are their CVs. When a position comes open, please consider one of them. When you're proactive and you actually put it right out there in their face and they can't deny the fact that they have these five CVs sitting in front of them, it makes it much easier for them to be able to say, okay, let's consider this. If, they're, if it's not right in front of them at any given moment, they'll naturally navigate towards putting a man on the board. So it's, it takes a lot of work on our behalf um, to, to approach these companies and to be proactive and reach out and say, we have an interest um, in, in being on this board. Here's our qualifications. We meet or exceed everything that you've asked for. It makes it very difficult for them to, to ignore it. Um, and once a woman is on that board, that usually leads to two and three because a woman now has a voice on that board. Um, so I think if we take the time to actually reach out to these organizations, say, you know, we have qualified women, here they are, please consider them. I think we will find um, that by being proactive, we will have much greater success in achieving some of those board seats. Larissa, we have a couple of questions in chat, but that doesn't... Uh record so well. So I would ask Mariella to ask your question next and then Sandra. Hi, um, this is Mariella. How are you everyone? Hi Mariella. Um, hi, my question is what would you consider as being the appropriate qualifications for someone to uh, be considered to be a member of the board? So it depends on, on what the company is um, itself. Obviously, if it's a, you know, I mean, and this probably goes without saying, it depends on what sector, you know, if it's the financial sector, you certainly have to have a, some sort of a financial background. Um, you have to meet the overall mandate and purpose of, of what the company is. But, you know, you do need to have held some, some sort of an executive leadership role because the ultimate leaders in any corporation are those who sit on the board. Um, obviously, the background that goes along with it um, and the years of experience. I mean, it's, it's unreasonable to expect a corporate board to put a young 20-something um, on their board of directors because experience is something, experience and the knowledge that comes from experience are so valuable in giving us the perspective that we need to be able to enhance a board. Um, now for the young girls who are in their 20s and who do aspire to board seats, they need to be looking at advisory boards. They need to look at perhaps getting on a nonprofit board just so they can get the experience of what it's like to be on a board under their, under their, um, um, uh, under their experience. But um, for an executive board, it means that you have to have the qualifications of that sector. Um, you need to have the years of experience. You need to have some leadership experience. And then you have to have the, the, the tenacity and the drive and the ambition to actually pursue that board seat. Um, they do not just come to us. You know, very rarely does a man approach a woman and say, hey, I've seen your qualifications. Would you consider being on a board? If we, like I said, if we make it known that we want those board seats, it makes it very hard for them to ignore us. Otherwise, um, I think that's one of our biggest challenges. But to be qualified for a board, as long as you are within that particular sector, um, you have the years of experience that gives you the knowledge to be able to contribute to that board. I think that's, um, 
that's pretty much all that the men have to offer and that's what we need to be able to offer but um so hopefully that was helpful Hello? Thank you very much for that. Thanks. Uh, it's okay. No, can you hear me? Yeah. Cassandra, great. Uh, so um, you think it's important to be on the executive board before entering the advisory board? No, no, no. I think or, an advisory or... board is the first step. Um, that's usually not a paid position. That's usually um just more or less a, a guidance position you know they often offer up um the advice and the suggestions but nothing that is absolutely binding whereas a an executive board is a you know a very serious binding um, decision making position so i think for the younger girls as um i i i was saying i think the younger girls should start out on advisory boards just to get the feel of how board structures work get on a nonprofit board of directors um, but um, for sure as your career accelerates and as you gain years of experience um, absolutely every woman should try then to step up to the executive board because we have so much to offer um, our experience our knowledge our perspective the diversity of our thoughts um, you know, we really do have an awful lot to offer. So get the experience from an advisory board while you're building your career, while you're climbing the executive career ladder. Um, and, and then by all means, make it known that you would like to seek a board position and, um, you know, be proactive in it. And undoubtedly you will, um, find a board. Thanks a lot. Um, Amélie Leclerc here, Do you, if you hear me, I think we need uh, for the Europeans a slight clarification. I, I'm reading the messages and uh, people are asking also about administrative boards um, regarding, because the term executive board or advisory board, I don't see here in uh, France or in Bulgaria, etc. So, well, an executive board, sometimes it's called administrative board, um, the corporate board, board of directors, they're all terms that are generally synonymous, paid board positions. Uh, they're usually for corporate boards. Um, an advisory board is usually just a group of individuals that are convened and they're non-paid and they essentially come together periodically to um, strategize a particular problem, um, or give advice to a company that is is new and starting up. Um, it's often a way for a new company to get some credibility, you know, get some uh, influential people and put them on an advisory board, which is unpaid, but, um, but they come together periodically to advise the business on how to grow or what strategies they might be able to implement. Whereas the corporate board, um, administrative board, board of directors, those are the types of boards that are the um, decision makers for a company. Those are the ones that will um, keep the executive team accountable. Um, very rarely is the CEO of a company also the chairman of the board. Um, so the, the corporate boards, which are paid boards, are the, the decision makers of a company. When they make a decision, it's binding and, um, and usually has to be implemented by the, the business. Um, if they recommend changes, it usually means that those changes have to be implemented. So a corporate board um, is a very you know, significant part of the operations and decision making of a corporation. Whereas an advisory board is just that, it gives advice. This is Jaya Ramanathan. I noticed that you mentioned a corporate board. Do you have to be a shareholder to actually step into a corporate board? Um, I think in Australia, there is a requirement that board members, um, especially in the corporate board, are in some form shareholders, they might call maybe a small parcel, but they are shareholders. So do you advise 
women who are aspiring to be in such boards to actually acquire some shares? No, it's abs. I mean, yes, there are always your majority shareholders and so forth that sit on boards, but many of the board seats are not um, shareholders. And there's actually good value in doing it that way because when you are closely attached to a situation or a company and your interests are impacted by that, you often channel back to a very um, linear and conservative way of thinking. So it's important that boards have um, members that are not stakeholders because they're the ones that can see the bigger picture. They don't have any personal financial impact attached to um, the, the uh, success or failure of that company, except the fact that they're on the board and responsible. But um, it's important that boards have both shareholders um, as well as non-shareholders so that you can have a, a full and complete picture and unbiased um, perspective as some of the decisions are made as to the operation and the forward, um, the forward movement of that particular company. So no, you don't, you do not have to be a shareholder in every board that you're seeking to sit on. Um, if you look at many, at least here in the United States of the S&P 500 and Fortune 500s, you will see an almost even match of those who are um, the big stakeholders versus those who are invited board seats. So, um, so as you decide that you want to pursue corporate boards, you know, I, I still say isolate 10 to 20 companies that you feel that you would be a good match for, that you have the, the qualifications and knowledge. Um, you know, you wouldn't be in a, a manufacturing, you know, you wouldn't be on the board of a manufacturing company if you came from the education sector, you know, so you have to at least match the qualifications of the operation of that business but you don't necessarily have to be a stakeholder um, of that company. That would be a, a real um, game changer as far as the, the gender diversity of our boards if you had to be um, a stakeholder before you were considered to be able to be on a board. Uh, that would be a really limiting factor also for the company as to you know, who could be board directors. So it's in the benefit of the, the company and the corporation to make sure that they have a balance between their stakeholders and their non-stakeholders, because it's the non-stakeholders that will be able to have those um, more progressive, um, more dramatic, and more realistic at times um, views as to where the company needs to go and, um, and the types of operations that the company should consider. So please reach out to companies, regardless of whether you're a stakeholder or shareholder or not. Thank you. So where, Thank you. We are coming to the end of our time. We want to um, ask Dr. Yasmin for her comments because she wanted to make a comment. And after that, Larissa, if you would just give your concluding remarks and then I'll jump in to finalize. Perfect. Dr. Yasmin. Thank you very much. Well, uh, something that I always said to BPW members is uh, to bring uh, men to our conferences and uh, to show him, them how important is these facts uh, to uh, fact, uh, the fact that uh, having women on boards, the company will be more productive. productive. And uh, when they can realize that they can improve their income, which is very important, then uh, they, they, they they act in a different way. But we really need to invite more men to our conferences, to our workshops, and uh, from there to start this campaign uh, and to show them the, the amazing possibilities that they have having women on boards. This is uh, uh, an strategic that we have to really start and not only this about uh, um, equal pay that they don't even know many of them what is going on outside their um, boys club 
Yasmin is 100% right. It has to be a dialogue between men and women and it has to be inclusive because that is the only way that we're going to stop seeing it as men and women and gender balance and gender diversity. We will be able to stop this gender discussion altogether once we start having mutual dialogue and we become together just business people and just executives and we don't have to attach that moniker of man or woman before it. So men are critical to this dialogue and I fully agree that men need to be a part of the BPW conversation. It was certainly my pleasure. Um, I hope that I've given some value to you all today. Um, you know, and I hope that you will take the time to reach out, research and reach out to to companies where you feel you could add value and send your CV and make your intention to be um, a board member known. And, um, and I think we will begin to see these numbers go from 20% to 30% to 40% and potentially even higher. And um, if any of you wants to reach out to me directly, please feel free to do so. And I'm so proud to be a part of BPW and to be able to see my sisters today um, it gets rather lonely when you're confined wherever you are in the world. So I hope that you all stay safe and, and we'll see each other at a conference again soon, I hope. Thank you so much, Larissa. And thanks to everybody for participating in our webinar today. Um, we do also hope to see you next month at our next webinar and that will be posted as usual. Remember too that all these webinars are recorded and posted within the next couple of days to our YouTube channel dedicated to this purpose. And that will be announced on our Facebook page as well. And so please join us next month and please share this with as many of your BPW sisters as possible. Good day to all of you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Okay. Bye, Louisa. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.